on the Andy Moore Automotive Group Hotline from The Athletic. He is Stephen Holder. Um, I said this a little bit earlier. Um, I'm glad that Andrew Luck is not participating because this is like the pre, pre, pre to practice going on during minicamp. <laughs> I mean, he realistically could get the wide receivers, the backs, and the tight ends together and essentially do what they do out there in his own backyard, right? So we're all good? Yeah, this is – this is practice for practice practice for practice (laughs) yes yeah i mean why chance it man look i mean you know i'm not going to invoke kevin durant here but you know why just why do it you know i mean is a championship on the line it's like it was last night i don't think so so i'm with you now that being said i did ask frank Reich today i said frank i mean look i'm not sounding an alarm here or anything but when you told us this was minor I mean, that was one thing, but we're talking about a month now. So, I mean, would, can you at least allow that it's not as minor as maybe you previously thought? So he did admit that, yes, it's on the longer end of the minor scale, if that makes sense. So I think at least we're clear on that. But if this was during the season, he wouldn't miss very much, right? Would He, he wouldn't I, be missing anything? I, I got to think that he might miss practice, but that he'd play. You know, right. I think the, the pra- practice is where you have that gray area. It's, are you doing more damage by practicing than sitting out and resting, right, and getting treatment and doing the things that you do when you are hurt? Now, when it comes to Sunday, though, you at that point you lay it all on the line. And if that thing goes, then it goes. But, I mean, at the end of the day, you got to suit up, and, and they're not going anywhere without any luck, right? So, I mean, uh, at that point, I think you put it on the line and he plays if it's a regular season scenario. Clearly, that's not what this is. Uh, We're talking about glorified practices. Not even glorified. We're talking about sort of, you know, half-ass practices. (laughs) You know, because they're not wearing pads. You know, I mean, so it's, yeah, yeah, they're doing the right thing. They're definitely doing the right thing. Yeah, that's what I said, backyard. It's in the backyard, messing around and... um... You know, you guys, you guys have it tough because when you get the opportunity to watch things, you have to figure out how you can incorporate it to anything that you say that will matter one ounce later on in the year, don't you? Well, look, I, I, I know we're making fun of it, and and I, I do feel this way. I mean, I'm not, I'm not just kind of going along with you. However, what I would say though is there are some things that you can glean, right? I mean, what I say about OTAs is OTAs are reps. That is the most important thing about OTAs. They're just reps, right? I mean, you just do it over and over and over. And then you'll get really into, I think, the, the mean stuff when you get to training camp. That's when you start thinking about, okay, you know, we might run this against, you know, the Chargers week one, that kind of thing. Those conversations are not happening yet. Okay, let's be clear. But, but the reps are important, and I think they're important especially for – for new guys. I mean, they have some additions, you know, the Campbells, the Funchesses, guys like that. These reps are important for them. But for a guy like Andrew Luck, I think it can be overcome. Look, let's remember now, Andrew Luck, last season, no offseason work unless you count, you know, sort of the the uh, sort of softballs he threw in their mini camp, that which would have been one year ago this week. You know, that was when he debuted in front of the media, right? Yeah, but he, he was throwing better, nerf. he was throwing Nerf footballs or mini footballs or something, right? Yeah, well, before that, that, yeah. that week he did throw, well, the first day of minicamp he threw with the college football, and then the second day he graduated up to the big boy ball. <laughs> but here's the deal. So he misses all that time last spring, right, up until the final week of the off season, And then what happens? They won a minicamp, the guy is out there and doesn't even miss a beat. Now, was he in midseason form? No, but he was pretty damn good. So I think – when you consider that and his ability to hit the ground running last year under that scenario, now take what he's dealing with now, which pales in comparison, okay? Do you have any fears that Andrew Luck will sort of be a a different guy when training camp starts? I certainly do not. I think this is a much milder scenario. So the missed time this year is nothing to compare with last year. And he overcame that just fine, even in spite of it being worse. So Stephen Holder, the athletic, covers the Colts. He's on the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. I completely agree with you um, regarding that. All right, I, I do want to ask you this. So what do you think you know by virtue of of what you're going to see, what you have seen, you know, when you have talked to these guys 
And I, I do want to start with a free agent pickup that I think is going to be relatively important on the one-year deal, being Devin Funches. Is there anything that you can come away with as far as, well, so far so good, so far not so good? Yeah, I think it's a good addition so far. I think what I've seen on the whole, I like. And and what I, what I would say about that is here's the thing about Devin Funches. Consider what his role is going to be. His role is going to be help in the red zone specifically and to be something of a possession receiver, you know, a guy who can, who can be that big body and run sort of those in-cut routes that you hear Frank Reich talk about. He's ideal for that. And so they have a guy who I think fills a specific need within that position. And that's the one thing the Colts have been really good at, I think, in free agency. They have done a good job of finding guys – who meet their needs. Last year was Eric Ebron, who gave them that athletic tight end, uh, the guy who could sort of stretch the defense a little bit from that tight end position, a different guy than Jack Doyle, right? They did a good job there of, of finding what they needed specifically. Well, I think they looked at their receiving core this year, and what they did with Devin Bunches is exactly that. They found a guy who, he's not the best receiver out there necessarily, but he's a guy who gives them something they lack. So he gives them the big body. He gives them a red zone presence, which they didn't have, okay, with their other receivers. Let's be honest. Their red zone presence last year was Eric Ebron. Well, they've changed that now with, with the addition of Devin Funches. T.Y. Hilton, great as he may be, look, you can't throw the back shoulder fade to T.Y. down from the three-yard line, right? But now they have an option where they can do those kinds of things. You're going to see a lot of Devin Punches in the red zone, no question about it. Hey, Stephen, I got Naheem Hines on the show coming up tomorrow. Do the Colts' overall expectations, do they uh, any way equate to his expectations? Because having talked with him maybe a month ago, it seems like he's got some lofty ones in year number two. I, I really will tell you this. They have – well, let's, let me rephrase it this way. Everybody I talk to, they don't want to say this publicly, okay, but everybody I talk to within the organization, they have this unbelievable anticipation for this season. I'm telling you, they have high expectations of themselves. They think, look, they're not going to say it publicly, but they think that they should be the ones holding that trophy at the end of the year. They think they have every opportunity to do it. Again, they're not going to go out and say that. All right, they're not going to go on your show and say it, maybe, or right, they're not going to go on NFL Network. And, I, I you know, hope they do. I hope they say it on my show, do. Stephen. Yeah, <laughs> they might. Now he might, but Frank Reich certainly is. Andrew Luck certainly not. Uh, Chris Ballard certainly not. But but I'm telling you, there is an air of confidence around there, and they think they have something. They feel they really feel it. There's a there's sort of a pulse, and I know it's it's June, and it sounds. Stupid. It sounds ridiculous, right? Why are we talking about the Super Bowl, right? It's June. But I'm not joking, man. I'm telling you, I'm just telling you, you rarely hear people around an organization sort of broach the subject of, man, you know what? This might be our year. But people are saying that, all right? People in the building are saying that, and I'm not even just talking about players. So I'm not going to name names, but I you know, think you can figure it out. So I, I'm just telling you, there's there's a supreme confidence around there. It's not a guarantee. It doesn't mean a damn thing, frankly. But the fact of the matter is they see something. They see what I think a lot of us see, which is a hell of a lot of potential. What do you think is more out of sorts? The doom and gloom that – and I, I said 8-8 eight and eight last year, and I, I guess the, I, I would address that as doom and gloom. The doom and gloom we had this time last year about the 2018 season or those lofty expectations that you were just talking about that have been tagged to the 2019 campaign? <laughs> it's like you talk about polar opposites, right? I yeah. mean, that is the – you talk about extremes. Right, that's about as extreme as it gets. I actually think – the excitement and the anticipation is as palpable as the doom and gloom we saw last year. It, it, they're about as far apart on the ends of the spectrum as you could possibly imagine. That's what we're looking at right now. I, I really think that the the positivity and the, the hope that we're hearing, I think it's every bit as tangible as the, the fear and the, uh, you know, sort of apprehension you know, that we saw last season, really the past two seasons, uh, going into the last two seasons with Andrew Luck. I agree. I, 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 it's it's <laughs> I can't almost... believe we're here, right? I mean, yeah. it, 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 it sounds ridiculous. And I don't know, maybe they only win 
nine games or something. But I, I don't think the hype is unjustified. I, I really think there is a justification for it. Um, look, I was out there today watching, and you know, we only got a couple days left, so I'm trying to pick up on whatever I've missed. And I remarked to a couple other colleagues, I said, you know, the position battles that we're talking about now are much different than those that we were that, that we were sort of debating in years past. In years past, it was like, uh, who's the number two receiver? <laughs> you know, like we don't even know that. Now it's like, all right, is Chester Rogers going to make the team? You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not, I'm not sort of commentating on whether he's going to make it. My my point is, those are the kinds of discussions we're talking about now. All right, is there room for a guy who's been on the team four years or a defensive back, for example? Uh, we're looking at, you know, I'm looking at Marvell Tell out there. He's a fifth round pick. They like him, and I'm like, you know what? Uh, he's got a lot of work to do to make the team. Not because he sucks, but because he's got a lot of guys in front of him. They're deep, man. They've got some depth. I'm telling you. And this has not been the case in the past. In the, in the past, it's been like, okay, well, I know who the starters are. And then beyond that, I don't like this team. <laughs> you know, and, right. and I don't feel that way now. I'm telling you now, I feel like, okay, uh, I think I know who the starters are. But then, you know, I, I tell you, they got a battle for the third spot and the fourth spot and the fifth spot. I mean, like legitimate battles, like where, where in some cases veterans – have to scratch and claw. So that's a good thing, man. They're, they have revamped this roster as much as any in the NFL the last couple of years. So Stephen Holder, the athletic, he joins us via the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. I'm sure you saw this a little bit earlier. Jim Irsay tweeted out, my GM, Chris, invited every staff member in the building into his draft room for a football update. Total inclusion, the unsung grinders. What exactly does that mean? What does Chris – how does he inform it? And I'm assuming it's everybody over there, right? That we're talking about. Yeah, I I think it. I think it was probably, you know, you have a, you have so many people in the building who, who are not what you would consider football employees, right? And even some people who are, you know, support staff and that kind of thing. I mean, they're not really included, right? I mean, they're not in the meetings. They're not in, you know, they, they don't have any role in the decision making and that kind of thing. But what Chris Ballard does that I think is interesting is he has sort of an appreciation for everybody's role. Okay. Whether that role be uh, the person who uh, does administrative work, whether it's the people who, who deal with the in-house media, which he's very in tune with. Uh, He has an ability, I think, to, to really form an opinion and educate himself about the role of everybody in that building. And that I think is a smart thing to do as a leader. A lot of times, it's very easy as, you know, when you're running sort of the football operation, it's very easy to, to dig a bunker and stay in there and only worry about what you do and leave the rest of it to someone else. But I think uh, smart leadership is to realize that it all matters. And, and that's something that you hear Chris Ballard say. All of it matters. Everything matters. Everything you do in the building. And so one way you do that, and one way you, you sort of get everybody on board and on the same page is to engage them, keep them engaged, too. And I think that's very important. When, when the boss – look, anybody in any job can appreciate this. When the boss appreciates what you do, hell, when they even know your name in some cases, okay, that, that, that just sort of gives you a different level of engagement and you feel a different level of appreciation. Look, uh, it's like any other – uh, organization in any other industry. And I think he just kind of understands leadership. And Frank Reich does, too. He he is someone, I think, who is fully on board with that because Frank Reich wants everybody on his staff to feel like, and I don't just mean as coaches, but I mean just generally everybody in the building to feel like they have a role in this team doing whatever is going to happen this year. And I think that's very important. And, and it's got to be rewarding for, for the people uh, who may otherwise not feel a part of some of those functions. You know, three years ago, they asked me to come over there, and this consulting firm, they were going over things that um, I thought, and I don't know why they are asking me, could help them organizationally. <laughs> and one of the things I did write down after I wrote down Peyton Manning's name 19 times was, um, <laughs> was um, transparency. And I, I taught yeah. transparency over 
last year, basically uh, to the point where everybody was kind of tired of me saying the word itself. Um, this is a much more transparent organization, and I'll compare it to this because the previous regime was not transparent and it was bad. However, the regime prior to that was non-transparent and it was fantastic. So we've seen all versions of it, yeah. but this is the by far most transparent I have seen. And I don't know where it compares to the rest of the NFL, but it has to be somewhat alone uh, given the information that they just readily put out there. So you talked about the previous regime, well, two regimes ago, you know, Polian and Dungey and Caldwell, et cetera. Now, they had a lot of success, as you said, despite not being very transparent and basically taking, <laughs> at least Polian, oftentimes taking an FU approach <laughs> yes. to information. However, that is earned. That's something that was earned. Uh, Tony Dungey didn't walk in the building and, and have this opinion, that had this attitude of, I'm not going to tell you anything, <laughs> okay? You have to earn the right for people to trust you. And I think that's what, that's something that Chris Ballard and Frank Reich understand. All right. Why should we trust you? Let's say a year ago, why would anybody, had they earned the right to be trusted? No, not necessarily. Uh, and they understood that it would take some doing and you have to earn that. And, and they did earn that. And that I think is why you're seeing them continue to do that. I mean, not that they have to continue to do it, but, but certainly that was the payoff for them doing it. And I think that was the, the impetus behind it was, okay, people, we, we need people on our side. we got to fill the building, first of all, right? I mean, they were having enough, enough trouble doing that for a little while there. So if you can't, if, if they can't trust you, are they going to put their money in your pocket, <laughs> right? So and those are the little things that matter, I think, when it comes to, to getting people back on board. They understood there was an organizational-wide understanding that, Look, people don't necessarily – they're skeptical, I guess, is what I'm saying. There was a lot of skepticism. They know it. We know it. And to their credit, they didn't just take the approach of, well, if we win, they'll come back. No, they took, they took a much different approach, which was, look, you know what? We've got to get people back on board, and we've got to get these people to trust us. We have to earn that trust. It is not something that – you're just sort of entitled to. And so I give them a lot of credit for that because there are a lot of NFL teams that just figure, well, this is the NFL. You should just show up and you should just trust us because we're smart. And you know, a lot of those teams, I look at their records and I say, well, based on what? So I think there's a really, there's a real understanding of that there. And that, that stems from the leadership. Those two guys in charge, there's no question about it. They, they touch pretty much, they influence everything that happens around there. And that's a good thing. I um I don't know, and I'm going to ask you this because I, I I don't know what went down in in Kansas City, and maybe you don't either. But but where 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 Ballard was, I think Ryan Pace was there, right? Are the Bears was he there too at some point, or does he have had, was he, he influenced been, by I, that? I, I, recall, I know yeah. Brett Brett Veach, who's now with Kansas City, yeah. was was that the way that that John Dorsey, who's now in Cleveland, ran the Chiefs organization when when those guys were essentially all together then. Yeah, I think a lot of the things that, that Ballard has done uh, stem from his relationship with John Dorsey. I mean, he considers John his mentor. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, for example, you notice after the draft, we have the opportunity to hear from the scouts who, who scouted the players that the coach ultimately select in the draft. Well, that wasn't something that Chris Ballard cooked up. That was something that, that John Dorsey used to do in Kansas City, and Ballard is now carrying it out here. And it's, it's frankly one of the most informative things that we get throughout the season or throughout the year. And I'm, I'm so glad they've continued to do it. We've done it now. Uh, all three of Chris Ballard's drafts, we've been able to talk to those scouts, you know, who were the, the first point of contact to these players. So it's very important to get that, that point of view. Well, as I said, that is something that stems directly from his experience in Kansas City. So I think a lot of the things – that you see Chris Ballard doing stem from that. Another one, for example, is Chris Ballard has a uh, sort of unofficial policy that once the once the season starts, like once training camp starts, he hands the reins to Frank Reich or whoever the head coach is in terms of being the spokesperson. So you're not going to see Chris Ballard come out in the middle of October and have some big press conference. That's not going to happen unless, there, unless something's gone terribly wrong, and he has to. Uh, it, it's going to be the domain of the head coach, and that's a belief that also stems from 
you know, his previous experiences with, with front offices that he's worked with, including Kansas City. So he, he definitely takes his cues from his predecessors or, or people he has worked for previously. And, and certainly John Dorsey, I think, is number one on that list. Seemed like that would have been tougher for Dorsey to do with, with some of the personalities they had in that locker room in Kansas City. And I don't know if that's advisable for what they have in that locker room for the Browns. And by the way, Pace yeah. was with New Orleans. Nagy, obviously, is the coach, and he was within Kansas City. So there's where the do- there dots are connected. And, and Pace, by the way, comes from the football factory collegiately we know as Eastern Illinois. And there's been a, ver- a variety of NFL-level <laughs> folks come out of that uh, Charleston, Illinois institution over there. Hey, Stephen, what are you writing about? Uh, well, I'm, I got uh, my latest piece I, I'm really excited about. It. It's actually been up, uh, I think, since late last night. But uh, this is my piece on Frank Reich and his time in the ministry, which, you know, you wouldn't think would have anything to do with football. I mean, if you don't know, for any listeners that don't, he was a Presbyterian minister and was in the ministry, in the Presbyterian ministry between a seminary and actually pastoring a church for about uh, four years or so, four or five years. And it, it's very interesting. He left that to join Dungy's staff back in 2007. Uh, he just kind of felt like he, he had this urge to come back to to football. But the point is, uh, there are so many parallels between what he did in the ministry and in the clergy and what he did in running a football team. I never envisioned it, but that ended up being the story, uh, just the link between the, the, the qualities of Frank Reich that applied then and now and how they're both helping, or how they help in, in both roles. Very interesting. Being calm, cool, and collected in two faith-based yep. guys, one being Frank Reich and the other being yep. one of my all-time favorites in Tony Dungy, the similarities yep. with that in mind are there. Yeah, you know, and it doesn't have anything to do with, like, what you believe. I don't care. Exactly. You, I completely agree. I don't agree. care if you pray to God or pray to Satan. I mean, it doesn't matter. My, my, it's not even about that. The point is, they're they're sort of uh, anchored in in their beliefs, and you don't have to agree with the beliefs. That ain't the point. It's not it's not a story trying to convert anybody. I don't care what you believe. But the point is, though, I think when you're when you're principled and you, you're anchored in what you believe in, and you've got really strong principles, uh, that that tells you something about you. And I think it it helps in leadership when people see, okay, well, this guy's about something, and I think his. His subordinates see that, and I think they respect that, and people respond to it. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Holder of The Athletic is on the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. You can check that out. Always a pleasure, man. We'll check in again very soon. Thank you, buddy. All right, my man. Talk to you soon. Stephen Holder of The Athletic on the Andy Moore Automotive Group hotline. Anybody? 